Biodynamics is making a big name in the wine industry, but it's not really the most critical group. Uh, what I've always wanted to see is really good hard stuff where you see one plot and it's flourishing and another one that's struggling and we say it's because of my magic potions or because the moon was doing something or other there was this difference and then I can relax and think okay now I can put my energies into it wholeheartedly mm -hmm. but until such time you know it's still got to earn its spurs and um, yeah you know if I, if I think of the uh, if, if the whole organic movement were to be a family, then the stuff that Henry Doubleday, Lawrence and, and has done here, it's kind of like dependable mum and dad, you know, hard work, composting, uh, getting on with it. And they've got a, a young son with dreadlocks and muddy boots called permaculture, not yet earned its spurs, a little bit edgy. And then there's this dodgy old geezer in the background. Popping in and out of his shed, smelling a bit odd, doing some mumbling about cow horns. Uh, and we're kind of fond of him because we know he was there at the beginning, but we're also just not really sure what he's been doing all this time. So I'm going to show you some of um, Grandad's work from the shed uh, and some stuff that's uh, quite new and interesting. Uh, and Julia asked me particularly to bring one experiment about GM. So I've done that, even though it's maybe not the most robust, it's a really good start. So what do we want? Evidence-based change. When do we want it? After peer review. Uh, this is our struggle. We haven't <laughs> demonstrated that much um, evidence-based change. And uh, Yes, okay. So Samuel Hahnemann, do you know who this guy is? Founder of homeopathy. Uh, 200 years ago. Homeopathy is kind of along there with astrology and biodynamics. Kind of somehow limped it onto our wonderful new culture. And everyone knows someone who thinks they've been helped by it. And, but we're not quite sure how to integrate it into uh, our lovely, clear-headed, evidence-based new world. Um, and what he did... What, uh, if you're not aware, I imagine most of you are, but we'll go over it. He takes a substance and he dilutes it to bring out its abilities, which is the opposite of uh, the common sense of a tea bag. You, know, you leave it in longer to get stronger if you want a bit more of your umph in the morning. So something's going on against the paradigm that uh, we get educated in and taught. Uh, he was a... Um, a contemporary of Avogadro. So at the time when chemistry was coming out of its alchemical dark roots and uh, the statistical and you know, the periodic table, all these good hard solid rocks were coming together, uh, there were some struggles going on. Hahnemann over there, Avogadro down in Italy. And as, oh, this is his number, there used to be a good joke about Avogadro, but this escapes me right now. Anyone got any good Avogadro jokes? <laughs> yeah. There's a good one on placebo. Do you know who placebo is? He's the Marx brother that was thrown out because people only thought he was funny. <laughs> okay, it's not a great joke. No. So as you potentize, if you take a mother tincture, like a herbal, you know, uh, put some plant in alcohol and water, ooze out the goodies, you get a mother tincture. And let's assume it's molar, so you've got this many active uh, bits. Uh, we've diluted 1 to 100, so we're down to 10 to the 21 molecules, 10 to the 19, 10 to the 17. If you carry that on into the brambles out there, then you get to a point where there should be nothing left. And homeopaths go beyond it, and so do biodynamic people. We've got a fundamental clash about worldviews there. Okay, they're always negotiable worldviews, you know, lovely discussions, sometimes down a pub, sometimes within academia. But this is the big one for homeopathy. So the second big problem is this one. You've probably all seen this. It's loads of maths and science, and then a miracle occurs, more maths and science. And this is one of the problems is that homeopathy and biodynamics hasn't really established its, uh, how it could possibly be true. Let's be frank, who thinks it's all bollocks? Go on, come on, your hand was almost up. Yes, good. Three brave people. 
Get them, lad. No. Um, well done. It may well be. <laughs> but it's an interesting thing to, uh, to try and find out, it's particularly with plants. So uh, with the biodynamics, there's, a, there's some tools in the tool bag that you don't get from any other agricultural activity. Um, but for, the, for uh, the testing, plants have a slightly different role, not in getting bigger, better crops, but for doing uh, replications, ethically sound replications. Uh, you, know, you can do the stats if you've got a thousand plants, whereas you know, each individual is so individual, it's very difficult <coughs> to, to work. So both from the scientific point of view and the ecological, there's something there. So thanks for coming along. Don't throw anything too hard, please. Questions I'm happy with. So this is the general reaction to biodynamics and homeopathy. Just really like the picture. I think that's an axe. You know. yeah. What the hell was going on? That one I'm going to leave. So this is Steiner. Uh, died in 1925. And in this building uh, in, on the Eastern Europe, Kobowitz, he gave a, a series of eight lectures some of you may have read. Um, which you put into various different books. Uh, people thought it was well enough to get every word uttered by the master and write it down. And since then, he died very soon after. Um, uh, there was a lot of research going on in the background, but these were the kind of public face. There's been all sorts of people trying to replicate the, the, the good bits and really uh, nail down the parameters. And the, uh, the leading lights of these would be particularly Lily Callisto, who uh, went to see Steiner in the beginning of the 20th century uh, and worked with him at, at the school. He, he started the Waldorf School, you're probably aware of those as well. Um, and in the grounds there was a shed where they did this, the natural science work. Uh, and Lily worked there and then uh, uh, she, when the Nazis got really heavy she came over to Gloucestershire actually in a place called Edge just by the school where my kids go uh, and did phenomenal work. First bit of science starting in before the agriculture course in the 1920s and she wrote this book called Agriculture of Tomorrow uh, just funnily enough just at the time that the Second World War was um, breaking. And her husband died, Second World War was starting, she was a German in England. It wasn't a very comfortable time for her, but she put out the work about testing different potencies of different substances against plant growth. So these are all gladioli. Uh, and the, if you, imagine whole ranks for each. It's not just one plant, one potency. These are just uh, illustrative. There's water. Uh, so the control, 7th potency, 14th, 21st, 28th, and we notice differences, uh, unless we've got a real problem. <laughs> so something happened at the 21st, it got better. Hang on, it also got worse either side. So often homeopaths will say the more you potentize, the stronger it gets. Our findings have always been that there's a highs and lows of efficacy against potency. It's a rhythmical phenomenon rather than a linear one. Uh, and she, the work this woman did is just industrial strength on her own. She apparently didn't have a great sense of humour, <laughs> and that allowed her to just be focused, you know, really determined, a woman on a mission. So this is experiment with wheat, first to the 60th potencies. So potencies from uh, the water control there along to the 60th, and each of these dots represents hundreds of wheat plants that have been germinated and measured both in their leaf and their root. Uh, and there's the book Agriculture of Tomorrow, if you're interested in pursuing this, I recommend it as a, a starter text. Um, if, even if only to encourage you <laughs> what one person's life can achieve, it's, it's, she's a phenomenon. <coughs> so these are with the gladioli. Uh, manure potencies, one's done in a cow horn. You're aware that cow, um, biodynamics does really bizarre stuff with, yeah, you know, the witchcraft thing isn't helped <laughs> into uh, history with that. It's, it's just pantomime witchcraft stuff. But, you know, she's done the work with uh, preparation 500 in the cow horn, done in an earthenware pot, and not a cow horn. And you can see that the average is way down. 
Um, potencies of manure just as they are. Fresh manure uh, and kept in the laboratory so it's had a certain amount of time to mature and get that fresh cut and edge off it. It's good science. It's um, the hard basic work that needs to be done to establish this footing out of the voodoo camp and into the science camp. So, there you go, Lily, before she died in 1976 in Gloucestershire. Um, I salute her, she's amazing. A bit of a heroine. These are the various other people who are uh, really seminal to this work. You recognise any of them? <laughs> yes, well done. So Goethe, uh, let me show you, the metamorphosis of plants. Goethe is known for Faust and various bits of you know, troubles of young Goethe, but he did a lot of scientific work as well. So this is from MIT, the metamorphosis of plants. Do feel free to have a look. What Goethe did, okay, slight step backwards. Uh, if biodynamics is the answer, what the hell is the question? Why would we need this stuff? You know, we've got perfect answers to many things. What the question is, uh, or one of the many questions is, um, what is a plant? How does it relate to the soil, to the heavens? Um, Goethe came up with a view which is very different to the Linnaean and certainly very different to the genetic in that he looked at how plant form, what it looks like, uh, the conclusions that can be drawn from its form. Excuse me, I'm getting a dribbly nose here. Have you got any paper just to... I'm allergic to my own voice, apparently. Oh, bless you. Whoa! I hope this is paper. Thank you. <laughs> oh, getting so emotional. Uh, Goethe looked at how the leaves emerging from the growing plant vary over time. So the, the original cotyledons, then you're getting into the basal leaves. Let's assume it's an annual plant. The first leaves are large and fleshy as they grow. And as, they, as you get towards the, uh, the sepals, you're getting more indented uh, leaves. You can set those out in a, a pattern and you can see the development in a single plant. You can also see a development uh, and he, he had this time called the, the journey to Italy, so going, uh, going from his native Germany up of the Alps and down to Italy again. And he observed particular species as they varied from the lowland, the alpine, and then the maritime uh, ecosystems. And so you can imagine, let us say, the dandelion. So the dandelion is an interesting um, uh, one to do the, that leaf sequence. But if you take one from the uplands, particularly if you're in a siliceous soil as opposed to a basic soil, you'll see uh, that the indentations happen much earlier, that they're kind of biting into the round lobed leaf and into that sort of spiky version, happen much earlier in that growth uh, pattern. Uh, uh, he, he's, that book, I think, is brilliant for looking at various other metamorphoses including the one from an individual leaf as it grows embryologically. It's a fascinating book. So he established a, uh, a discipline, I would also say a science, of observing plant form. And when Steiner, this is Hahn, when Steiner gave his course, he, he, it wasn't until about lecture five, he said, and some of you are probably wondering why I never mentioned improving nitrogen in the soil. He says, I've been talking about it all the time. Because in those five lectures up to then, he was just talking about plant form. This whole talk was about the form of plants. Uh, and he, Stein was a, before he went really weird and started doing cow horns and stuff, he was a great scholar, uh, working both with uh, critiques of Kant. He, he, he gave the uh, eulogy at Nietzsche's funeral. You know, he's right up there with the high academic boffins in Germany at the end of the 19th, uh, yes, the 19th century. But, um, I lost my thread. Yeah. yeah, he was talking about the, just the form and how to deal with that. Uh, Lily Callisto, after Steiner's death in 1925, Lily carried on the work and a few people in the recent years 
from here onwards have been carrying on that work. Uh, so some people have developed their own preparations. So this is uh, Hugo Erbe. And these guys, these two are still alive. These two just died. <laughs> um, but Glenn Atkinson, Enzo Nastati, uh, Vaikuntanath Das Kaviraj, and uh, Dr. Waris, names to look out for in dealing with modern issues. Now, uh, it's happening all over the world. So, in New Zealand, Australia, uh, so that's Glenn's work, and he's working in Australia and Chile, primarily with kiwi fruit in the fruit growing industries. Uh, Enzo in Italy has gone over a lot of the Spanish and Italian speaking world. Homeopathy went to India with the Raj. So, there's a lot of stuff from India and Pakistan. So I'm also going to the Middle East looking at drought issues and very uh, interesting work all over the world. Universities in Brazil studying it, Cuba and Mexico, amazing bits of work. We don't have time to go into them all. But certain successes with uh, various pests, uh, seasonal issues, increase, increasing uh, photosynthesis, protecting fruit from frost in the, that early uh, part of the year regenerating humus, certain diseases, composting, and uh, this one which I'm finding particularly interesting in the minute, dealing with pollution. So at the moment, the, the Italian guy, Enzo, he's just been over to China, where they've got an area three times the size of Italy. And it's got salination problems from deep water aquifer irrigation. And they've been able to reduce that within three months to about 40%. You know, phenomenal changes. They're things that are hard to ignore if you, uh, if you believe me and if I believe them. You need to check it out. You know, it's, but it is very interesting work. We've got a job at the moment in Aberystwyth where Tesco's are making a new Tesco Metro. It's the site of an old gas works. They've got naphthalene, they've got... Um, well, that, see that book going around? I'll come back to naphthalene. This is how that work is developing on metamorphosis. People are working on it all the time. They've got lead, they've got hydrocarbons, naphthalene, and asbestos in the soil, and it's being dealt with with this stuff. And I haven't got the results yet because we're still doing it. Uh, and people have come from all over the world to study. The first international conference had uh, people from 13 countries, some of whom you probably recognise there. Gracious. Yeah, yeah. He's, he's, he's a being. Is he still alive? <laughs> Okay, so uh, for a while, this, I started collecting results from anyone and everyone. This is what I call the democratic research. I think there's other words in, in uh, the work you do. What, what other terms have you got for it? Uh, when, peop peop transformative when people get together, not always. Participatory, yeah. So the homeopaths have got a lot of sort of uh, vociferous, yes, homeopathy is the best thing ever. And so people have tried to do work, and I've collected all that together. But a lot of that was just chat, looking at a sort of pre-rigor um, stage, just what have you found, what have you found, which is a good one that we can follow up and see if it's really going to su survive the test of time. But there was a piece of research that I want to show you now with mealybug in cotton that was done in Pakistan. Uh, it's a huge cotton exporting country and as you know, I expect, cotton is very hungry for water and pesticides and insecticides. It's a real, you know, it's, a, it's not, to get a good shirt costs the earth quite a lot. So Dr. Waris, uh, a homeopath in Lahore, worked with the plant re breeders research people there. Funnily enough, their NIAB is the Nuclear Institute of Agricultural Botany. God knows why. Uh, and the, yeah, all the, all the main research bodies got together to deal with mealybug. Here is Dr. Waris, who's also died recently. Both of them smokers. Go figure, as they say. Um, so it's going to be impossible for you to see back there. But uh, what this was was uh, his preparation, which is homeopathic, well over Avogadro. There's no no chance that there's any of the original substance left. Uh, Actar is a neonicotinoid and then there is the uh, control here. So it's looking at, seven, after three days and a week again, uh, at the 
adult and nymph stage of the mealybug. Essentially what happens is that both Actara, the neonic, is up around about 90 to 100%, but so is the homeopathic version. This is year 2008, this is year 2009, another cultivar, all the experts hopefully dispassionately observed, unless there's you know, whatever the rupees of Pakistan are under the table. And again, very similar results. And these are percentage of mortality compared to the control, which is at zero. So it seems to me pretty robust uh, research done disinterestedly by the experts in cotton, uh, and hopefully no beef to grind about homeopathy and uh, biodynamics. So I started going public after this. I come out of my little scary homeopathic closet and started talking to folk because this uh, seemed to me a line in the sand, a sort of proof of concept. As unlikely as it seems. Uh, I'd like to show you some other work. This is Glenn Atkinson, a news, uh, an Aussie working in New Zealand up in the Bay of Plenty, where there's loads of fruit, particularly the kiwi fruit. This is kale, and uh, there's three plants here. I'll try to grey out. It's not always clear, but here's one, curly kale, second one, and a third one in the background there. Um, now, these, again, looking at the form of plants, what he's done is try to maintain this kale in the big leafy phase, just, just leaf after leaf after leaf. This one, he tried to make bolt to go to seed. And the one at the back, he uh, started originally to work with the, um, the burgeoning phase and then to bring it to seed. All done with homeopathy. All done with these little fellas, actually. I mean, this is what it looks like. It's just bottles of clear liquid. More expensive than Perrier. Could be just me making water expensive. You have to decide. But this is what he was using to control the, how the plant manifests. Um, this kale went on for three seasons before kind of dying of old age, he said. <laughs> this made me think. He's done other trials. So orchards, because so many of the uh, orchards will put out their flowers at spring, one late frost, problem. So the pip and stone fruit grows of uh, the northern island of New Zealand. Uh, put a lot of money together after the 2002 frost that just wiped it out. And because it's very expensive land, because you can make a hell of a buck, if you lose a crop, you're going to suffer proportionately. So they got together with Hort Research, which is the government lab, and said, what's out there? What can we do to deal with frosts? You can put a windmill in reverse, i.e. plug in a windmill and blow the frost out of the orchards, out of the frost pockets, uh, and just hope that yours isn't the orchard at the bottom of the hill. Um, but they tried various other things, and because the industry is set up for spraying, uh, they tried various sprays. And one of the nice things about this is that the guy, who, Glenn again, the guy who makes the preparation didn't put his preparation in one of the other orchardists. Uh, handed it in, so he was unaware of this research being do done. But uh, the unsprayed in the red and the sprayed in the blue, uh, you can actually measure the temperature within the plant by one of these micro probes, these temperature probes, and they've got uh, an average of two degrees difference. So he's managing to protect down to minus two degree frosts and minus four, he gets some result, but it's not conclusive. Beyond, below that, you're back to stuffed, but you know, in those marginal frosts, it's actually um, demonstrating itself. And interestingly enough, not just with uh, people who are convinced, it's, it's used uh, in um, chemical orchards and all sorts. It does what it says on the tin. Uh, other work from Glenn while I'm at it. This is to do with uh, evaluation of a bird repellent spray on uh, Pinot Noir. And high bird damage in the yellow, moderate bird damage here, and low bird damage here. This is the water control, and this is with the homeopathic stuff. So you're getting much less damage uh, in the homeopathic one. 
This one hasn't gone commercial because it's still not enough to guarantee growers what they need to do to uh, feed their kids, but uh, it, was, it was significant. Again, done by Hawk Research, NAMAS accredited, etc., etc. And photosynthesis again, uh, the water control in the blue, Photomax as he calls it, this one, one of these, in the red, and it's stomatal conductance, which is an analogue of photosynthetic uh, activity, uh, again and again showing that with these preparations, something objective would appear to be happening. That's, uh, that's, it just comes in a bottle, you dilute and spray. And farmers quite li like that. The trouble with biodynamics is you spraying for an hour. You know, they, there's a few who say, oh, I don't, don't care if I have to stir for an hour, I'll do it. But most people just want to put it in, in the spray and get on with it. So Glenn works with that and uh, I support him in that. So GMO, because you asked me to talk about GMO. There you go. It's just a nice picture. Um, Sorry, sorry, don't mean to offend any sensibilities. It's just funny. Okay, so this was an experiment done early 2000s in Italy by Enzo. Now, Enzo is an interesting character, fascinating character. Uh, if you read any of the biodynamic stuff or Steiner stuff, it's way out there. It is way out there. It's so far off of the academic map, you'd think there'd be no bridge, really. Uh, he's He's... He'd be certified if, <laughs> if, uh, if societal norms were to be <laughs> applied. He's so far off norm. But he was cocky enough to think that he could make a preparation to deal with GM uh, contamination. Uh, and it was at a time when uh, you know, there was hysteria about GM. The big companies saying, oh, it's fine, and it's just doing what nature does all anyway, but a bit faster. And uh, then other people uh, saying, really? You, you want to let this off into nature and spread everywhere? I imagine this kind of debate is familiar to you. So what he did is he took uh, some yellow corn and some white corn. They will cross-pollinate. The yellow is genetically dominant. This is from the actual field where the work was done. Good and scruffy, the weed problem uh, is still a problem. The rest of the images are just nicked off, off of Google because I don't have more images, but just to illustrate. Don't let me down. There we go. So yellow corn from Google. Genetically dominant over the white. And this, in the experiment of rows of white, rows of yellow, rows of white, rows of yellow, rows of white, rows of yellow, was done with GM um, corn, a uh, yellow, yellow corn. So the white corn uh, is genetically recessive gene, and it's biodynamic seed, but also sprayed with the preparation that he said will, uh, um, he calls it GMO repel, OGM in Italian. So you have one row of the white, BD, GM yellow, BD white, GM yellow, I think you've got the picture. So the, the, uh, the white seed was given a seed bath of the preparations. And then at the time when pollination was happening, the, the, uh, the heads were also sprayed. So what would I expect from a Mendelian genetics? Yellow dominant, white recessive, and I'm assuming for this that it's just one to one. Yeah. One gene that's expressing. I actually don't know. <laughs> so uh, from the daughter generation of the yellow corn, you'd expect the vast majority also to be yellow. Would you not? You would not, good. Um, from the daughter generation of uh, white corn, you'd still expect the majority to be yellow and a minority to be white. And the controls showed this. What did happen? From the daughter of the yellow corn, there was 38% yellow but 62% white. And from the um, daughter generation of the white corn, hardly any yellow at all, 98% white. 
So what the hell's going on? Bad science, dodgy research, bunged a fiver and lied. You're going to have to find out for yourself. But this is what I found. Oh yes, this is the self-deprecating bit. <coughs> it could be bollocks still. But there is a lot of um, research showing strong effects. So my task really is just to infect you with doubt <coughs> and, and look at it yourself and maybe we can collaborate to look at this. <coughs>